The Fed has never seen a recession, never forecast a recession, but they know their economic history. We are eight years into an expansion. This is, it, it feels punk. I mean, the growth is anemic, but you know, labor force participation is low, productivity is dropping. There are a lot of bad things going on, but in fact, we are in the eighth year, actually coming up on, soon be entering the ninth year of an expansion, which began in June 2009. Right. By the way, you have a hard time convincing most Americans that we're not still in a recession. Depressions are different than recessions. You know, the technical definition of a recession is two consecutive quarters of declining GDP with rising unemployment, a couple other bells and whistles, little subjective factors, but that's basically it. So people, when you say depression, they're like, huh, depression sounds worse than a recession. And if recession is two quarters of declining GDP, then a depression must be like 10 quarters of declining GDP because it's got to be worse. But that's not the definition. The definition of a depression, you can have growth in a depression, but it's below trend growth. In other words, if trend is three, three and a half, and you're actually banging out one and a half, two, that gap between, let's say, one and a half and three and a half percent growth, that's depressed growth. It's an output gap. It compounds over time and you never get it back. We are losing trillions of dollars of wealth. We are impoverishing future generations on a relative basis because of our inability to get back to trend growth. So the reason American people feel this and don't listen to the economists and they're right is because we're in a depression. So leaving that aside, the Fed at least understands the business cycle and the fact that the next recession, you know, they say they don't die of old age, but they do die and we're getting closer to the next one. So they are in a desperate race to get rates up to three and a half percent before the next recession hits so they can cut them to get out of the recession. The question is, can you raise rates enough to cure the next recession without causing the recession you're preparing to cure? That's the dilemma. That's the finesse. My answer is no, they're not going to be able to do it, but they think they can. Why are they in this box? Well, because Bernanke should have raised rates in 2010, 2011, in the early stages of the expansion, when the economy would have been much better able to bear it than it is now. Bernanke skipped a whole cycle. He skipped a whole rate increase cycle to pursue these wacky experiments and, you know, QE and zero interest rate policy and all that. I spoke to Bernanke about this and he used the word experiment. He said this was an experiment. He, you know, Bernanke made his academic reputation by studying the Great Depression, you know, in the wake of Friedman and Anna Schwartz and some others. But he, he was a great scholar of the Great Depression and he got his chance to kind of try out his theories. But what he told me was, he said, 30 years from now, some new Ben Bernanke, some young scholar will look back and tell us if we did a good job or not. We actually don't know right now. See, the, the Great Depression was, was really two technical recessions, 29 to 33 and then 1937, 38. But from 33 to 37, we had an expansion. But the whole thing was a depression because we never got out of it. You know, the stock market recovered the 1929 high in 1954. It was a long time to get back to even. But Bernanke's mantra was doing something is better than doing nothing. I completely disagree. It's better to do nothing if you don't know what you're doing. And this is really the monetary equivalent of the Hippocratic Oath. You know, doctors say, you know, first rule of being a doctor is first do no harm. Anyway, bottom line is by pursuing QE and zero interest rate policy, Bernanke failed to raise rates during the early stages of a cyclical expansion, which he should have done. If he had, if he had, the economy would have been just fine and we'd be able to cut them today, but he didn't. So Janet Yellen now has to make up for lost time. So that's the mission. But again, and this is what the market completely does not get. And the Wall Street economists don't get, nobody gets this because they see the Fed raising rates and they've done the correlations and the regressions back to World War II and they go, huh. Every time the Fed raises rates, the economy is getting stronger. So if the Fed's raising rates, the economy must be getting stronger. So bid up stock prices, et cetera. But that's like saying umbrellas cause rain. In other words, they've got the causality backwards. The Fed never leaves the economy, ever. The Fed follows the economy. So a normal business cycle looks like this. So you get a little expansion going and unemployment starts to go down and industrial capacity utilization starts to go up and inflation starts to go up. And the Fed's watching, 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 and then it keeps going. They go, oh, it's getting a little hot. We better raise rates. And they raise rates. But of course, they started too late. The expansion keeps going. Inflation keeps going up. Unemployment keeps going down. Then the economy starts to cool down. Unemployment goes up and then prices go down and capacity utilization drops. And we get into a recession like, huh, we better cut. You know, and then they cut and cut and cut and cut. And then you hit the bottom and then you come out of it again. 
So think of that as like a nice, pretty sine wave, right? That's a business expansion, business contraction over and over 30 or so times since the end of World War II, with the Fed always following the economy, never leading the economy. So all the big brands on Wall Street, they've got all this data and they say, well, every time the Fed raises rates, the economy is getting stronger. That has absolutely been true for like 30 times since the end of World War II. It is not true today. The reason it's not true today is because Bernanke skipped the cycle and they're playing catch up. For the first time since 1937, the Fed is tightening into weakness. That is a key thing to bear in mind. The Fed is tightening into weakness. They are not leading the economy to strength. They are not responding to strength, even though Wall Street thinks they are. And there's a great danger that they're actually going to cause the recession they're preparing to cure, as I mentioned. The Fed will raise rates 25 basis points four times a year from now until the middle of 2019 until they get them to three and a quarter percent. So like clockwork, every March, June, September, December for 2017, 2018 into 2019, look for a Fed rate hike until they get to three and a quarter percent, at which point they'll be able to say, all right, now we're three and a quarter. If we have a recession tomorrow, we can cut them back down to zero again and get out of it. That'll be mission accomplished. Now. This is why I'm sitting there in December like, yep, they're going to raise them in March. And right now, I'll tell your listeners, they're going to raise them in June. There's your Fed response function. There's your baseline scenario. What are the exceptions to Fed rate hike? And under what conditions will they not raise rates? Because this, everything I just described to you, they've had in mind since March 2015 when Yellen took patience out of the statement. That was the end of forward guidance. And by the way, if you go back to 2015, you know, I said they're not going to raise rates all year. And... They weren't going to do the liftoff that the people were looking for in March, June, September. And they didn't lift off in September because the Chinese rate exchange devaluation. The stock market fell out of bed August 2015. Finally, they raised them in December 2015. And Wall Street was ready for March. I said, no, in June, no, September, no. It wasn't until December 2016 that they raised them the second time. So obviously, there are conditions under which they don't raise rates, notwithstanding the baseline scenario. So what are those conditions? There are three. Well, four, actually, so if you see job creation below 75,000, that will cause them to pause. By the way, pause is the key word. If you go home through the speeches, you'll see the word pause in Dudley's recent remarks. Pause is the Fed's jargon for we're not going to raise rates. We got the gym scenario, which I took from the Fed. It's their scenario. Or a technical recession. So, you know, we're going to know Friday what the first quarter GDP is. It's pretty close to negative, but... I'm not saying we're in a recession now, we might be, but if you see a recession, they'll pause. See job creation below 75,000, they'll pause. By the way, that's a very low bar. You know, if you see a jobs report, see, this is the other thing that confuses Wall Street. You see a jobs report with 100,000 jobs, so Wall Street goes, oh, that report's really weak. The Fed's going to think twice. No, 75,000 is the number. Yellen told us that. It was in one of her speeches. You just have to be a geek like me and, and read all the speeches. So the third factor would be disinflation. So the Fed has this 2% inflation target. They missed it for six years. They're finally getting close to hitting it. By the way, I think the listeners know they use the uh, PCE core deflator year over year. There's PPI and CPI and core, not a bunch of inflation indices, but we know what they use. PCE core deflator year over year. That actually has been getting close to 2%. But if you see it turn around, if you see that gap down to like 1.5, 1.4, 1.3, 1 then they will pause. The last condition for the pause is a disorderly decline in stock markets, more than 5%. If you see a 6, 7, 8% decline, so if the S&P went down 100 points, Fed doesn't care. Dow Jones goes down 1,000 points, Fed doesn't care. But beyond that, if you see the S&P start to go down 150 or the Dow start to go down 1,500 points in a disorderly way, it looks a little scary. It looks like there's no bottom. It looks like if you see that, they'll pause. So the Fed is going to raise like clockwork four times a year for the next two and a half years, unless you see job creation below 75,000, disinflation, a technical recession. If you don't see one of those things, they're going to raise rates. And so right now, I don't see any of them. I mean, they could all happen, but... It looks like, you know, growth is going to be positive. Job creation has been decent, you know, over 100,000. Disinflation is probably coming, but not quite here yet. And they'll want to see a couple months in a row. And the stock market's not crashing. So none of the pause conditions are in place. Therefore, they will raise rates. Simple. 
in 2020, they were back to where they started in 2013, except worse because the balance sheet was even bigger. It's not going to take seven years this time. It might be more like seven months. And the reason is twofold. Number one, we're more leveraged and the stock market is more bubbly. And so the whole thing's more vulnerable. Number two, the market has seen this movie before. Like, hey, we watched this play out. We know it, we know it doesn't work. And the Fed blocks. Now, so if the Fed suddenly slams on the brakes, says we're not going to keep raising rates along the lines I projected earlier. Okay, that might give the stock market a boost. And you can't assume that won't happen. You got to watch for that. But I would expect that things would have to get pretty ugly in, in all events before the Fed got that message. On the other hand, if, if Powell gets confirmed and feels like it's his last term and here's his chance to be Paul Volcker and he's just going to keep raising rates, he said, my job is to get inflation under control. The rest of you people, you're responsible for fiscal policy and tax policy and spending and um, you know, shutting down the Keystone Pipeline, welfare, and all that. That's on you, not me. I my job is to get rid of inflation. If he does that, and he could, he might. You're looking at a recession. Kind of looks like the global financial crisis, and hope it doesn't. And there is a difference between extreme recession and financial crisis. They're two different things, but they can happen at the same time as as did happen in 2008. Would the Fed back off if it became apparent? that they were going to cause a stock market crash, a disorderly collapse, and a severe recession? The answer is almost certainly yes. But the problem is, it might happen uh, anyway. In other words, they, they might have gone too far. And this almost happened in 2018, and that was my mm -hmm. point. It was that by, the, by the time they realized their mistake, it might already be too late. So that's one danger, which you, if, they, if they had perfect information, oh, gee, we went too far, gee, we couldn't pull this off, we need to back off. They might back off exactly as you described, but they don't have perfect information. They have flawed models. They tend not to look at history and they could behind the curve. They could crash the car before they knew it was out of control. It's like s slamming on the brakes on ice. You can slam on the brakes, but you're going to go for a long time before the car stops. So that's one problem. This, the second problem is you, you have to separate, as I said, recession, even severe recessions from financial crises. In 1998, we had a financial crisis, but no recession. Uh, in 1994, we had a financial crisis, no recession. In 2000 and 2020, we had a severe recession, no financial crisis. That was not a financial crisis. In 2000, 2001, we had a, the, the NASDAQ collapsed 80%, but there was only a very mild recession, and that was not a financial crisis. So the Fed might say, and again, might, because who knows, but they might say, well, of course we don't want a financial crisis. Now, to your point, Nick, nobody wants that, and they do get out of control. But we're not worried about that. You know, we learned our lesson in 2008. We had Dodd-Frank, uh, and I had this discussion with uh, uh, James Gorman, the CEO of uh, Morgan Stanley. I briefed their board, and they, they gave me a lot of pushback. They said, well, you don't understand, Jim. We've, we've, uh, we've, you know, we have more capital and greater liquidity and less leverage and better credit. And I, I granted, I said, you, you're absolutely right. It's a nice job. You're a stronger bank now than you were then. But in a financial crisis, it doesn't matter. The, the, the problem is systemic. In other words, as an individual bank, you may be better off. But if the whole system's collapsing, you can't necessarily withstand that. So they, they don't want that. But what if they said to themselves, you know what? We don't want a financial crisis, but we don't think that's going to happen. But we'll but maybe we'll just have to bear a recession. Volcker knew what he was doing. Volcker knew that there was going to be a recession. And the recession of 1981-82 that he caused was, at the time, the worst since the Great Depression. Now, we've surpassed that twice since then, uh, 2008 and uh, 2020, although it's hard, it's hard to know what 2020 was. I mean, down 36% in two months and up 38% in the next two months. I mean, what what is that? But... Uh, but at least in technical terms, um, we've had two worse recessions, 20, 2008 and 2020 since then. But at the time, and I, I began to live through that, I was around, uh, that was the worst recession. But Volcker knew that would happen. He said, that's the price we have to pay to break the back of inflation. And he did. And by 1986, inflation was like 2% or 1.8%. Now, there was far less worry about financial crises at the time. Uh, because remember, this was before the repeal of Glass-Steagall. 
you know, commercial banks, no one really cared about investment banks. They could fail. So what? They cared about the commercial banks and they had a pretty good handle on that. Um, so they weren't worried about financial crisis, but today you would be, uh, be for the reasons we mentioned. So the so there are two possible major blunders here, but again, don't under, underestimate the Fed's ability to do both. One <laughs> one is that they could they could decide they don't want a recession, but not know until too until it was too late. They just tighten into it, don't know it until it's too late, and then the damage is done. The other one is they could sign up for a recession, say, yeah, sorry, but that's the price of getting inflation under control and trigger a financial crisis that nobody wants, but could happen anyway. So, you know, it's kind of so and Caribdis, uh, you know, take your pick. Severe recession, but we know it's coming. Recession that causes a financial crisis that we didn't want, or just let the inflation rip. What's the good outcome there? What, what's the good one? Yeah. But I think I think those are the three choices. I think you're right. The everyday American has been, uh, oh, 40 years at this point of being miseducated on the topic of gold. So they, uh, they, they're not... Uh, very much into gold. You go around the world, you get very different results. You know, Switzerland, Germany, they, they, Austria, they love gold. Uh, of course, China, Asian countries, I think Australians have a much better sense than Americans do. So uh, there are the, the buyers of gold, but you say, well, okay, well, who are the big buyers of gold? The answer is the central banks. Now, right there, that should tell you something. So these are the, the most powerful, most plugged in, most heavily monetary institutions in the world. And they're the ones buying gold. Now they would have you believe that gold's not money, gold serves no purpose. You know, it's a, the first ones to say John Maynard Keynes said it was a barbarous relic, which he never said, by the way. He said something. Uh, he said that he said he used the phrase barbarous relic in reference to the gold exchange standard of the 1920s, which was a hybrid gold foreign currency standard, but the foreign currency is not gold. So he said that's a barbarous relic, but he never said that about gold himself. And actually, toward the end of his life, he favored a Bretton Woods. He favored a gold, uh, a global currency called the backward, backed by gold. And you know, it's not guesswork. There are papers he published at the time, and that was rejected by the United States, which kind of ran the show. Partly because our, uh, well, not to get too down on these, but our our our, our undersecretary of the Treasury, who was our representative at Bretton Woods, was a Stalinist agent. He was a communist. This didn't come out until the nineties after the fall of the Soviet Union, when a lot of classified information was released, all the KGB files, et cetera. But it was revealed and fully documented in a book by Ben Stile called uh, um, Battle of Britain Woods, that he was a communist agent. So what was, he, what was he trying to do by insisting that, by running Keynes's idea off the road, insisting that the US dollar be the anchor? He was trying to destroy the British Empire, which he did, because he knew that there were far more claims on the Bank of England when they had gold, and that would be inherently unstable. And that would derail sterling as one of the global reserve currencies and undermine the British Empire, which it did. So um, that's a little, uh, a little bit of a backstory, but it goes to the point that uh, Keynes was, was an advocate for gold at different times in his career and, and at the end of his career. And that when the central banks are buying, I should tell you something. Now, I've said for years, um, you know, I've always pointed to Russia and China. Russia has uh, almost quadrupled their gold reserves in the last 12 years, starting in 2009 through 2020, uh, 2021. They've almost quadrupled from about 600 tons to about 2,400 tons. China, the same from about 600 tons to about just under 2,000 tons that they report, but they're non-transparent. They have a lot more gold than that uh, stashed in uh, something called SAFE the State Administration on Foreign Exchange, which is a secretive Chinese stock and wealth fund run by an ex-Pinco guy, by the way. He knows what he's doing. Um, and they, they're not transparent. So the People's Bank of China is kind of transparent. SAFE is non-transparent. So every uh, six, seven years, what you'll see is the People's Bank of China will announce, oh, we've increased our gold reserves by 400 tons or 500 tons or whatever that's the case may be. And well, it's not like they went out the night before and bought 600 tons. You know, good luck trying that. You can't do it. Well, what it means is that that SAFE took some of the, the hidden gold that they had been acquiring slowly and moved in an accounting entry, moved it over to the People's Bank of China, and boom, there's 500 tons overnight. But of course, they had it all along and they still do. So they probably have more. So Russia and China are big acquirers, you know, triple and quadrupling their gold reserves. But now we're seeing it in a lot of other countries. Um, in the Philippines, Vietnam, uh, Mexico, 
Uh, Iran is a major buyer, but non non transparent. Turkey has drastically increased its gold reserves. These are these are major countries, uh, and they're they're adding. So so I look at that, and there's there's very good data from the IMF and the World Gold Council, so you can find this information. But the one that was just like not doing anything was Japan. They had about 600 tons, but they had 600 tons for 30 years. And then just about um, at this point, about six months ago, so late last summer. They bumped it by, uh, I believe it was, it was 50 tons, perhaps more. I don't look at the exact number, but it was over 50 tons overnight. It just went from, you know, 600 tons to 650 tons, just like that. Well, here's what you know. It's the same thing I said about Russia. You can't buy 50 tons overnight. Or not, you couldn't even do it in a month. I mean, the, the dealers would be working the order. It would be disruptive to the market. It would show, it would leave a lot of fingerprints, put it that way. But what it tells you is two things. Number one, Japan had the gold all along. They had it in some sidecar or side account or Ministry of Finance hidden account, what as the case may be. And they chose to move it over to their reserve position, which they can do. That's an accounting issue. But they had to have they had to have had the gold all along because you can't buy that much that fast. So then that begs the question: Well, why all of a sudden? Why now after decades? of holding your gold level constant, you all of a sudden step up in a big way. Um, a lot of possible answers to that. One, you know, China's making noises about invading Taiwan. Well, if you're gonna invade Taiwan, why not invade Japan while you're at it? It's just another chain of violence as far as the Chinese are concerned. Um, and after this happened right around the time, maybe shortly after um, the US debacle in Afghanistan, which was, you know, the worst foreign policy, uh, military disgrace, humiliation in U.S. history that I can remember. I don't know how far you have to go back to find a worse uh, turn, of, turn of events. And, and that there it was. Well, all of a sudden, allies all over the world, you know, Israel, um, Japan, Taiwan, they're questioning the United States. Like, hey, we're, you, we thought you're un we're under your nuclear umbrella. You stand by us through thick or thin. Here you leave Americans behind enemy lines. Perhaps, now this is speculation, but perhaps Japan sees the threat to Taiwan, feels they may be in the in the sights of the Chinese, feels the United States may not be as reliable as one had thought, and says, well, we have to we now have to step up a little bit financially, militarily, et cetera. And they're doing that. But it but that aside, that's a little geopolitical speculation, but that aside, the goal is real. They put it on the books. So the biggest buyers of the gold in the world are the central banks. By the way, from 1970 to 2010, central banks were net sellers. Now, some bought and some sold, but on, on net, they were net sellers. We had Brown's Bottom in 1999 when the UK sold half their gold at the lowest price in uh, about 60 years. They, hit, they literally hit the bottom of about $200 an ounce, to give or take. But, um, but since 2010, central banks in the aggregate of the net buyers, net buyers, sorry. So what does that tell you? It tells you that the most knowledgeable players in the world are adding gold to their reserves because they consider that a prudent hedge to the US dollar, if you have US dollar inflation, or to a collapse of confidence in uh, central bank currencies generally, um, or they're just saying, hey, we're, we're, we're part of the club. Uh, by the way, here's a good uh, trivia question for you. Uh, you know, if you're not, in a bar and a lot of brainy economists around, I uh, asked them, uh, bet, them uh, bet them a drink on this, ask them what percentage of U.S. reserves are in gold? The, and the answer in China is about 2%. Russia is about 20%. You know what the percentage is for the United States? 75%. The U.S. does not rely on euros and Aussie dollars and Canadian dollars for its reserve position. 75% of U.S. reserves are in gold. So don't let don't let any central banker, don't let uh, Jay Powell or Jenny Allen or any of these others tell you that gold's not a monetary asset. We have the largest gold stash in the world, and 75% of our reserves are in gold. So that's the U.S., uh, you know, as, as they say, uh, watch what they do, not what they say. When people talk about the price of gold, people say, well, gold went up. And then they say gold went down, you know. Um, but what? But gold really didn't do anything. Gold is a, is is an element. It's a ton number seven nine. It's a very nice, very attractive metal. What changed was the dollar price. So that's what people mean when they say gold went up. They mean the dollar price went up. And if they say gold went down, they mean the dollar price went down. Um, well, but what does it really mean? Does that is that telling you something about gold? 
or is it telling you something about the currency? Uh, and I would say when the um, dollar price of gold goes down, that means the dollar got stronger. Each dollar buys you a little more gold. And when the dollar price of gold goes up, I would say the dollar got weaker because each dollar buys you a little, little less gold. Uh, when you translate into weight, I always think about gold by weight. That's why I keep talking about tons and so forth, uh, metric tons. So, um, so fluctuations in the dollar price of gold tell you more about dollars than they do about gold. It tells you about the strong dollar and the weak dollar. So as the dollar price of gold goes up, what it means is that the dollar is getting weaker than now. So if you want to know the dollar price of gold, just do a long-term forecast on the currency. And you'll get to the dollar price of gold very quickly. So when you say, you know, is gold a good asset? Is it a good diversifier? Um, is the price going up in the long run? Great questions. And the way I think about it is, well, what's going to happen to the dollar in the long run, up or down? Well, what's the history of all central bank currencies? What's the history of all fiat currencies? What's the history of inflation? They all go down over time, not, not all at once. Um, and that's another source of confusion because people look at, well, the dollar euro cross rate, or uh, they say euro to dollar cross rate, is the, is the most heavily traded liquid, you know, foreign exchange cross rate in the world by far. So, uh, and in the past, I would say two months, euro has fallen from about a dollar twenty to today, it's about a dollar thirteen. That's a significant decline in the value of the euro and a significant increase in the value of the dollar. So a lot of times when people say the dollar is stronger or weaker, they're actually not thinking about gold along the ways we just discussed. They're thinking about some dollar index. But if you if you peel back the layers of the onion for every index, Dow Jones, Bloomberg, Fed, it's all basically the euro, euro style of course. Right? So yeah. There's some Canadian, Australian, and yen, and sterling. There are, there's some other currencies in there, but the euro is the line of shares. All these indices are really euro dollar cross rates. So when people say the dollar is stronger. Well, it's another way of saying the euro is weaker. Um, but, but currencies tend to trade within a range. They'll, they'll get here or they'll go here, but they're not like stocks. You know, major currencies, they don't go to zero. I mean, Zimbabwe, yeah, but the, the Australian dollar, euro, they're not going to zero. But they don't go to the moon the way Apple stock or Amazon does. They're they can be stronger or weaker, but they, they tend to trade within a range, which is, makes it makes them interesting to trade because you can spot those inflection points. So right now, when people talk about the strong dollar, they're really referring to the dollar value of a euro. But you could have a situation where uh, gold is going much higher in dollar values, and that would be as I said, a weak dollar, and yet the the euro could be falling faster than the dollar. So people. People always look at the euro and they say strong dollar, weak dollar compared to the euro. My only advice is look at the dollar price of gold. Use that as your thermometer. You know, a doctor walks into the room, they see the patient, they don't know anything. What's the first thing they do? They take their temperature. So uh, if you want to take the dollar's temperature, look at the dollar price of gold. The supply chain was breaking down before COVID. Now, of course, COVID made it worse. Yes. Uh, and the war in Ukraine made it worse yet. Yes. But this really started with Trump's trade war in 2018. So um, that, like I said, there's a thread that runs through all these things. So uh, not to throw out my hands, I'm not going to do that. But um, when you ask me that, I'm like, I'm thinking, well, you want to talk about China, Ukraine, supply chain, Biden, they're, they're all they're all a big deal. If, if um, you know, in terms of tragedy, probably uh, the war in Ukraine is the most important because it's highly, highly significant economically and strategically. But of course, it's a human tragedy going with it. You know, if Chinese real estate implodes, okay, there's some hardship here and there, but it's not like uh, people being killed or maimed or forced into refugee status. And that is uh, part of what's going on in Ukraine. So that's a, a that's probably the biggest single one, but I wouldn't uh, miss the fact that all these things are going on at once. The number one question, uh, of course, every, everyone's concerned about inflation, but uh, there's, there's a big backstory there. But I always say when it, when it comes to your own money, everybody has a Ph.D. in economics. You don't need Larry Summers to tell you what's going on with your budget and your you know ability to feed your family or keep a roof over your head. So people get inflation. It's one of the reasons it's so politically toxic is because it's unavoidable. You can't fudge it. You can't spin it. It's like, hey, if I used to fill up my Ford F-150 truck for 50 bucks and now it's 125 bucks, A, you get it. It's right in your face. And B, that's 75 bucks that you don't have to take your spouse out to dinner, you know, buy a new 
jacket or whatever. Um, so there's kind of demand destruction at the same time you're spending more money on the one thing you can't do without. So, so people get it. But then from there, the question I get the most is, hey, Jim, is this going to cause a recession? Are we going to have a recession? And I use as recently as a few months ago, I would say, yeah, I, I think so. You can see it coming late this year, early next year. Now I say we're in a recession. I mean, it's not coming. We're in it. And and there's data. I you know, I never make statements like that, Brian, without supporting it. And we know that um, the standard definition of a recession is two consecutive quarters of declining GDP. There are a few more bells and whistles having to do with unemployment and, and a few other things, but that's that's the rule of thumb. So based on that, and based on the best available estimate for a second quarter, likely to be accurate, we're in a recession today. Now. It's not severe, but that's like saying I got, I'm in bed with a you know pneumonia, but I'm not dying. Well, okay, but uh, we're in a re we're in a recession right now. Um, there's there's a lot of whistling past the graveyard. I mean, the stock market uh, is still you know greatly overpriced. There's still you know the buy the dips mentality hasn't gone away. It's still there. You got people like Jim Cramer yelling, you know, buy Netflix or whatever. Um, and uh, you know the, there's institutional support. Uh, this momentum trading, of course, 95% of the trading is by robots. So you got to reverse engineer the 27 year olds from Bangladesh who don't get out much. They're the ones really writing these algorithms. I mean, brilliant engineers, but you know, you'd have to show them around Wall Street. Um, but uh, so, so all that's going on. So we haven't really seen the real, the, the market collapse, stock market collapse that I would expect in association with a severe recession has not happened yet. This is just going to play out. It'll get worse as the year goes on. All right, so you're expecting a major correction in stock markets on yeah, the back I'm of a recession. Yeah, I'm not alone. I mean, I mean that that is my expectation. I have my own models and I look at it closely. But if you listen, you know, Michael Berry, uh, Jeremy Grantham, uh, you know, Charlie Munger, these people have been around and they they run, uh, you know, hundreds of billions, uh, and uh, they're saying the same thing. So you know, so every now and then someone will throw some statistic at me. And I go, "How long is your time series?" And I go, "Oh, we took it back five years." I was like. You know, talk to me if you've done it for 100 years, because that's a little more meaningful. But Jeremy Grantham actually did do a 100 year time series and looked at bubbles all over the world. You know, 1929, U.S., 1989, Japan, 2000, dot com stocks, you know, and, and many others. Um, and he said he's never seen anything like it. You know, it's a triple greatest bubble of all time times three in the sense that it's um, real estate, stocks and, and other asset classes. So, uh, yeah, I do. Uh, that, that is my view, but it's it's shared by a number of other analysts. And that would mean like S&P coming off another 20, 30 percent. Yes. Uh, and, and again, you remind you have to remind people um, 1929, the stock market fell 22 percent in two days. It wasn't one day. It was, you know, it was like 12 percent one day, 11 percent the next day. So 23 percent over two days. But that wasn't the crash. I mean, that was the beginning of the crash. This Dow Jones fell 82% from from top to bottom. Now it took three years. It, it bottomed in uh, June 1932, uh, started in October 1929, so not quite three years. But uh, that fell 82%, and and that happened. So uh, so yeah, we're down. Uh, you know, Nasdaq's down. Uh, bounced back a little bit in recent days. Down close to 30% down the S&P down over 20 percent we're in bear market territory but that that's just the beginning that's not what a full bear market full you know market adjustment looks like in the face of the kind of recession that I expect talk to me about inflation because you know I was looking at some of the inflation numbers and you have to go back to the 80s to see anything that's approaching double digit you know I remember being a, just a kid hearing about double digit inflation I could kind of remember the 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 gas pumps you know the lines at the gas it's like a distant memory of me in the 70s and but you know how do you talk to you know younger people these days about what inflation is or it means because i don't think people really grasp what it actually means to your savings or to the economy in an, even a medium term well that's exactly right brian and if you um uh, you know, you're you're a little younger than I am, but I I, I lived through it. I was uh, I, I started my career uh, in banking in 1976, and uh, so I start. I remember my uh, my wife and I used to kid each other. She was in advertising, I was in banking, and the inflation was so bad you'd get a raise every like four or five months, and. You'd
and you didn't have to ask they would just give it to you because they knew that you were going to quit if, if uh, they didn't keep up so she would get a raise and she was making more than i was at the time so we'd go out to dinner and then i would get a raise and i was making more than she was so we would just tease each other about that but that's how it was um and the psychology was you know if you needed a whatever you know a tv set or refrigerator new car whatever you say i better buy it now because the price is going to be higher if i wait a month or two months the price is going to run away from me so it it had huge behavioral uh, effects uh, of course gold was you know going to the moon there was, there was a lot going on at the time but but brian you're right when you say we're putting up inflation numbers today that are the highest in 40 years that is correct but i remind people the inflation in 1981 was the end of a 10-year period of inflation. That was when Volcker finally got it under control. But you go back to 80, 70, you know, 70 well, between 77 and 81, so that five-year period, the dollar lost 50% of its purchasing power, not 15, 50. So the question is, is this the beginning of an inflationary surge where it's going to get even worse and it is going to last five years or is it is it different than that but i but keep that in mind because the situation we're in today is very different from the 1970s and i'll explain why but um uh well let's explain why right now because in the 70s it was triggered from the supply side with first the arab oil embargo in 1973 as a result of the uh uh, the 1973 Arab-Israeli War, um, and then the price tripled, but it went from like you know, two dollars to to uh, to to six dollars. Okay, but you know, percentage terms, that's a huge jump, but it was still six dollars, and then it got to twelve, and then in 1979 you had a second oil embargo because of Iran and the Ayatollah and the revolution and the hostages and all that, and then it went from kind of twelve to twenty. So uh, oil went up by a factor of ten. Um, in the course of the late 70s for because of two different embargoes. So that's coming from the supply side. But what happened was the other source of inflation is on the demand side. So you have what's called cost push inflation. That's where you know supplies choked off or there's an embargo or there's a shortage, natural disaster, a lot of things. It's coming from the supply side and demand is inelastic. So you just pay up or you know kind of do without. Um, but the demand side is much more psychological. That's called uh, demand pull inflation. That's when consumers behave the way I described. And as I said, I lived through the 70s, um, where, you know, hey, I better buy it today, I better buy it now. You're pulling all this demand forward and bidding up prices because you're worried that it's going to get even worse. So as that applies to today, we are starting with the cost push inflation, you know, mainly the price of energy, but the price of food is a big factor. And of course, they're related. You know, it's like, I was like, here's the energy, here's the food. You know, where do you think the food comes from? You To get the food, you got to feed the pigs and cows. What do you feed them? You feed them corn. Huh, how do you get corn? Well, you grow it on a farm. You need nitrogen fertilizer. You need diesel in your tractors. Uh, you get the food. You got to put it in a truck to get it from point A to point B. That requires diesel. The higher the diesel price, the higher the cost of food because you're moving it by truck, et cetera. So these things, as I say, are linked. Um, but, but food prices are going up substantially and you can't, the two things you can't do without are gas in the car and food. So, so you have that, um, that, that cost push inflation. We're not quite at the stage where it's demand pull. We're not quite at the stage where individual consumers are behaving the way I described in the 1970s saying, hey, better, better spend the money fast because it's, it's losing value. We're not in the world of positive real rates. So then the question is, okay, how, how is the Fed doing at getting inflation to the target? The, the 2% we talked about, and we explained why that's their number. And this says a lot about what's going on in the stock market right now, because you go all the way back to August 26, 2022. That was Jay Powell's Jackson Hole speech. And he said, inflation's, at, you know, not, he didn't use the word out of control. But he said, inflation's way too high. We're going to bring it down to our 2% target. Um, we know unemployment is going to go up. We know he will probably have recession. He did not use the R word. He didn't say recession, but he said, you know, growth will suffer. Unemployment will go up. That's just a fancy way of saying there's going to be a recession. And we're not going to stop until we get there. Uh, and so in other words, too bad, you know, unemployment is going to go up to some number, I don't know what, four or five percent, which is pretty high. It's, it's right now it's uh, 3.4, I believe, the lowest since 1969. 
So unemployment is going to go up. The economy is going to go into recession, but too bad. That's the price we all have to pay to get inflation down under control. And the way to 2%, in other words, and the way Jay Powell rationalizes this, he said, yeah, that's painful. And we're going to pay a high price to get there, but we're going to pay a higher price if we don't. If we don't get to 2% and we let this thing spiral out of control and we even stay at 4 or 5% for a prolonged period of time, that the economic damage from that in terms of lost investment, misallocation of capital, basically people losing money on their investments uh, is going to be much higher than maybe a short recession. Here's the interesting part. Jerome Powell scares the market with six speeches. He said the same thing again and again. We need to get to 2% inflation, which means raising the interest rates even more, and therefore we're going to have a recession and unemployment is going to go up. With the Fed being hawkish, the market should go down. Instead, the market got rallied because they believe inflation is going to go down soon. Jim Rickards think the Fed is already reached at something called the terminal rate, a rate which inflation will go down on its own so the Fed won't need to raise the interest rates any further. But the Fed keeps raising it and making the economy crash even further. So how is it going to end? When will the Fed needs to stop raising interest rates? Let's listen to what Jim Rickards have to say. So he says that the market didn't believe him. The market rallied. I uh, went down a little bit right around that time, but then the market rallied in October. And he comes out at the end of September, he gives another speech at an FOMC meeting, comes out November 2nd, gives another speech, comes out November 30th, gives a speech at the Brookings Institution, uh, and then comes out in mid-December with another speech. And then again, a couple of weeks ago on uh, February 1st. So it's like six speeches in uh, about about five months. And he said the same thing every time. He said, we're getting to 2%. You know, believe believe me when I say it. We're going to have a recession. Unemployment's going to go up. Too bad. We have a lot of work to do. We're not done. The market has flipped on and off. Half the time, the market doesn't believe me. I go, yeah, you say that. But uh, in fact, inflation is coming down faster than you thought. You're probably, uh, I should introduce a concept. Uh, I guess a lot of people have heard of it, but there's this new concept called the terminal rate. The Fed's trying to get to the terminal rate. And so what's the terminal rate? Well, no one actually knows what the number is. I don't know, but neither does Jay Powell. But it's a theory. And the theory is, okay, the, the, the terminal rate is a rate set by the Fed that's high enough to bring inflation down without further rate hikes. We get to a level and that level is high enough that inflation will come down on its own just by waiting without raising the rate again. And the conundrum, I hate to use that word, but it is a conundrum. The conundrum the Fed faces right now is they have been raising rates and inflation has been coming down. Those two things are true. But is inflation coming down because they're raising rates in which case, maybe you want to keep raising them. Uh, or are you already at the terminal rate? It's coming down on its own. And now the danger is you're going to go too far. And that's the debate with Wall Street. And so Wall Street is sort of leaning to the view, now you're probably already at the terminal rate. Inflation is coming down. You need to back off. You need to stop uh, and probably pivot. This was the famous word for the last six months. The pivot means you're, you're actually going to have to cut rates. Uh, because you have gone too far and you're going to cause a pretty bad recession. And so the expectation as recently as December was that the Fed would pivot around March or April. They would, Yeah, they would raise in February, maybe March, but pretty quickly after that, they would cut rates. And if the Fed's cutting rates, buy stocks. You know, it's typical Wall Street analysis. It always ends with buy stocks, um, particularly tech stocks. So, with the current high interest rates environment and reckless government spending, what should we do to protect our money from inflation? Should we buy stocks? And what stocks should we buy? The Fed said it will raise the interest rates even further, but the market thinks the opposite will happen. So who's right and wrong here? Let's hear what Jim Rickards think. Spoiler alert. This is not investment advice. But the Fed has been saying the opposite. So this has been this battle where Powell goes one, two, three, four, five, six speeches, says the same thing. We're not stopping. And Wall Street says, oh, yes, you are. So buy stocks. Well, who's right? Well, there's no saying on Wall Street, don't fight the Fed. I don't think of it as who's right or wrong. You could have an opinion. The way I think of it is, I just want to know what you're going to do. Because if I know what you're going to do, then you can trade accordingly. You can plan for that and you can prepare for it. And what they're going to do is they're going to keep raising rates. Even if they're at the terminal rate already, I think they might be. Uh, even if they are, they don't think so. Their opinion counts for a lot more than mine. 
and they're going to keep going. But by the time inflation comes down enough to say, yeah, okay, we're at the terminal rate, nice job, it'll be too late. They will have gone too far because the Fed's always the last to know. China doesn't have any of that, none of it. There's no significant Chinese bond market. They don't have the infrastructure of banks and dealers I described. They don't have the physical infrastructure. And most of all, they don't have a rule of law. You can't trust the Chinese as far as you can throw them. I was a facilitator and then a participant in the first ever financial war game ever conducted by the Pentagon. We did this at a a top secret uh, location called the Warfare Analysis Laboratory. One of the things we did there, I was on the China team. I wanted to make it realistic. So I said, let's lie, cheat and steal because that's what Wall Street does. And that's that's a more realistic game. So I recruited a friend of mine who's fluent in Russian to be on the Russian team. And I had dinner with him before we went down to uh, to the laboratory. And I said, look, here's the plan. I'm, I'm going to persuade my China team colleagues to um, basically announce a, a new gold standard. And uh, we, we've accumulated enough gold and we're going to say for now and our currency is backed by gold. We're going to put the gold in Switzerland to keep everybody happy. We're going to issue notes from a, a bank created in London under, under English laws to keep everybody happy. Here's the thing. We're going to say from now on, if you want our exports, you have to pay for us in this new currency. We're not taking dollars anymore. And furthermore, and if you want some of this new currency, you can do you can deposit your gold in Switzerland and the bank will issue you some currency so you're in the system. Or you can trade with us and run a surplus and then we'll pay you in the currency and you can use that to buy our stuff or we'll give you loans. But one way or another, we're done with the dollar. And obviously this is very forward leaning, but the whole idea of a war game is to help the Pentagon think five or 10 years ahead. So the first thing that happened when these, you go to your embassy, your conclave, you, you come out and you stand up at the podium, you announce your plans, and then everybody reacts and it's discussed, et cetera. The first thing that happened is there was a group. So we had the, you had the red team, the yellow team, the blue team, as the case may be, and they're all different countries or areas. But there's a white team, which are the referees. They decide what you did. And the first thing they did when we announced the goal move, they ruled it as an illegal move. They said, no. No, that's not in any of our scenarios. You can't do that. And I stood up, about 100 people in the room, you know, three-star generals, CIA, FBI. You know, I said, wait a minute. I said, this is a war. There are no illegal moves in a war. The whole idea is to be out of the box. We live in a world where there are no boxes. That's what we're doing here. So they agreed. They said, okay, we, we think it's a really dumb idea, but we'll let you do it. Well, Over the course of two days, it accelerated and gathered momentum. At the end of it, Russia got PowerPoints. Okay, so this was 2009. Within 10 years, so so what were the what facts happened? Within 10 years, Russia tripled its gold reserves. Uh, Last week, the dollar value of Russia's gold exceeded the dollar value of its treasury securities. They have 20% of their reserves in gold, and their the value of their gold is more than the value of the U.S. Treasury securities. They're dumping treasuries buying gold. Exactly what we warned the Pentagon about 10 years ago. Um, and here it is in China has more than tripled its reserves. So we're not there yet, but we're moving to some kind of gold back world. But the point is, that was all in the war game. That's all in the book. And I made one other point. I said, Currency wars don't happen all the time. They might only happen twice in a century. But when they happen, they can last for 10 or 15 years. That's how long it takes to sort out. What you describe about the Chinese money supply is absolutely correct. People in the United States complain, oh, the Federal Reserve has printed $4 trillion in the past year. And they have. They have printed $4 trillion in the last year. They're taking the Fed balance sheet from about... 3.5 3.5 trillion to 7.5 trillion. So yeah, we printed four trillion dollars in the past year. Didn't do any good, won't do any good, but we did it. Uh, but Chinese money supply is even larger and growing faster. Now, I don't want to get into the weeds on China's internal monetary policy. I could, except to say that they're grossly over leveraged. The economy is investment driven, not consumption driven. They're about 40%, 45% investment. The US is about 25% investment. So that gives you some idea of how much, how investment is to the Chinese, which is actually okay if you're investing in productive assets that pay the way. They're not. They're wasting the money. I've, I've been to China many times, been going back and forth there for uh, 35 years. Um, I've been out in the countryside. I don't just stick to the hotel lobby in Beijing. I got mud on my boots visiting these ghost cities. And um, so each ghost city, there are a bunch of them, actually seven up. Seven, imagine building seven cities. That's what I saw. And so they got one or two skyscrapers and they got mixed use and they got retail shopping, a country club, a hotel, a golf course, a pond, highway stops, airport, etc. 
and it's all empty. I mean, it's just all empty. Shiny new construction, some of it's still under construction, um, all empty. So I said to the communists, I said, what are you guys doing here? I mean, no, nobody's here. Said, oh, don't worry, don't worry. People will be coming from the countryside. They will be populating these cities. And uh, I said, when? I said, no one's coming. And uh, besides that, you've already drained the countryside. That already happened. But I said, you cannot mothball a building. It's not like some old clothes. I mean, you the way a building maintains itself, it gets occupied and is maintenance and people fix it and all that. I, I, I visited, I used to travel a lot in Central Africa in the early 80s, um, Zaire at the time, today it's the Congo, I was in Kinshasa, but it was right after the 70s commodities boom. And they took the money, of course they wasted it and they built these skyscrapers in Kinshasa, which is like a swampy, scary, funky, you know, city. But there's a skyscraper, but the windows are falling out and there were rust stains running down this, the side and the elevators were broken. So it might have looked nice the day they built it, but it was never really used. And now it was literally when I was there, it wasn't that much later after they built it, it was falling apart. So that's going to happen in China. My point being, if you uh, apply, you know, generally accepted accounting principles to their investment account, you would write it off the day they open the building because nobody's there. It's not worth anything. So they're wasting the money. They're over leveraged. They're over printed. However, none of that has anything to do with the status of the Chinese yuan as a global reserve currency. The, the yuan is not a reserve currency. It will not be probably in my lifetime, maybe never. And I'll tell you why, because uh, a lot of people don't understand what a reserve currency really is. You know, you get a report from the IMF and it says, you know, 60% of global reserves are in dollars, which is true, and about 25% are in euros, which is true. So 85% of global reserves are in dollars or euro, which means the only meaningful exchange rate in the world is the euro US dollar cross rate. Everything else is working around the edges. You got some sterling and yen and Swiss francs and a couple other things. Aussie dollar is tiny, believe it or not, good currency, but not a, not a big part of it. And China's like this kind of invisible 1% sliced down at the bottom. And China has $1.4 trillion in its reserves. But here's the point. It's not as if they have pallets of $100 bills stacked up in the basement of the People's Bank of China. They don't. You invest in securities. In other words, they're dollar-denominated securities. So it's not actually dollars. The treasury bills, notes, and bonds denominated in dollars. So the thing that makes a reserve currency is not the currency, it's the bond market. You need something to invest in. Uh, again, so you need a, a liquid bond market with different maturities, different interest rates. You need dealers, you need auctions, you need payment and clearance systems, you need repo or repurchase agreements, futures, options, when issued trading, uh, you know, custodians, the rule of law. There's a whole massive infrastructure which we started working on uh, when Alexander Hamilton was, uh, you know, advising George Washington, and we've been doing it ever since. And others, Bank of England has done the same. China doesn't have any of that, none of it. There's no significant Chinese bond market. They don't have the infrastructure of banks and dealers I described. They don't have the physical infrastructure. And most of all, they don't have a rule of law. You can't ch trust the Chinese as far as you can as throw them. Um, and so they have no chance of being a global reserve currency, none. Same with the Russian ruble, same with a lot of other currencies, same with Bitcoin. There's no, show me the Bitcoin bond market. Maybe you can get my attention, but not sooner. So none of those are going to replace the dollar. I, first thing, I, I, my wife hates me to admit this, but I was once a registered lobbyist in Washington. I ran an office there. I spent a lot of time on Capitol Hill. And the first thing I learned in Washington is you can't beat something with nothing. You know, if you hate a policy or a program, you just hate it. You write op-eds. You put fine. You're not going to change it unless you bring something to replace it. So for all the criticisms of the dollar, and there are plenty of them, you're not going to dethrone the dollar as the leading global reserve currency unless you can show me what you're going to replace it with. And there's one and only one contender in the world today, which is gold. So that's a whole other conversation. I'm not saying we're going to be on a gold standard tomorrow. Uh, as far as China's concerned, yeah, China's a house of cards. It's going to collapse. It's going to be ugly. Hard to say when, but probably sooner than later. And they, and they know it. And they're not going to be a global reserve currency. So we can put China to one side, but yeah, China's a house of cards. Now, getting it back to the United States, the first point, let's talk about stimulus first. So yeah, the Fed printed three, sorry, the Fed printed $4 trillion. Congress, we had trillion dollar, what are called baseline budget deficits going into the pandemic. So with no pandemic, we were going to have a trillion dollar deficit in 2020 and 2021. Now, Congress put $3 trillion on top of that 
with rescue and bailout programs last uh, March, April, and May. That was the CARES program, payroll protection plan, um, aid to hospitals, uh, uh, extended unemployment benefits, higher unemployment benefits, et cetera. And I'm not saying any of those things were bad. It was needed uh, to keep things from getting a lot worse. But we put $3 trillion on top of this. So there's $4 trillion for fiscal 2020. They just did a trillion last week uh, in the kind of final days of the Trump administration. So that's five trillion. And Biden has announced his plan. He's going to have a two trillion dollar rescue bailout so-called stimulus plan now. So that's seven trillion dollars plus the trillion dollar baseline for fiscal 2021. So there's eight trillion dollars in deficit spending in two fiscal years, four trillion dollars of money printing by the Fed. Now, those are the numbers. That's not. That's not projections, that, that's baked in the pie. Just don't call it stimulus. It will have no stimulative effect. Does it, again, as I say, keep the lights on? Yes, Did, would, it, would just some people keep their jobs last spring because their employer got payroll protection plans? Yes. Did other people benefit from increased unemployment benefits? Yes. Was a lot of that necessary because things were in such bad shape? Yes. So I'm not arguing that side of it, but it does not stimulate. It's not going to get us out of the depression. Let me be very specific as to why, because I don't like to, I don't make claims without backing it up. On the money supply, you can print all the money you want, but Milton Friedman was wrong. The monetarists are wrong. The Austrian school is wrong. Money printing does not cause inflation. What causes inflation is something called velocity, which is the turnover of money. The money has to be lent and spent. Banks have to be lenders. People and businesses have to be borrowers. You have to be spending it. Get it in circulation, in other words, in order potentially to have some inflation. Uh, and that's the technical name for that is velocity. Velocity is dropping, sinking like a stone. By the way, it's been dropping since 1998. It dropped faster in the 2008 crisis. It's dropping faster today. But the trend has been very steeply down for the last 22 years. Um, and so the you know, nominal GDP, so the, the, the dollar value of all goods and services, leaving aside inflation, that's, that's what we mean by nominal value. Nominal value of gross domestic product is money supply times velocity. How much money is there and how much does it turn over? Multiply one by the other and that's your nominal GDP. And I remind people that $7 trillion times zero is zero. Meaning you can print the $7 trillion, but if you don't have any velocity, you don't have an economy. And so you can understand monetary policy is a desperate race between increasing money supply and declining velocity. One offsets the other so that you barely keep nominal GDP where it is. In fact, it's going to go down about 6 or 7%. We're not getting back to 2000. 19 levels of output. If you take 2019 as your baseline, we're not getting back to 2019 levels till 2023 at the earliest. We're not getting back to 2019 levels of job creation, the number of people who have jobs until 2025 at the earliest. That's why I call it a depression, not a recession. Now flip over to fiscal policies like, hey, they're sending everybody $2,000 checks. And they are, the people are going to get those checks. And so the, the Wall Street, which you know usually gets things wrong, that's the first thing you got to know about Wall Street, because they don't really care about you. They care about rap fees and how they make money. So they're saying, all right, they're going to send out the $2,000 checks and people are going to get those checks and they're going to run right out. And they're going to buy a car, a refrigerator, you know, paint the kitchen, whatever it may be. No, the first two things are true. They're going to spend the money and they're going to, sorry, they're going to borrow the money and they're going to send people the checks. But when people get the checks, they're not spending it. What they're doing, they're saving it. They're, they're either paying down debt, which is equivalent to savings, or they're putting the money in the bank, which is savings. So certainly if you lost your job, you're not going to take your friends out to dinner. You're going to throw the money in the bank or pay the rent. Uh, but even if you didn't lose your job, you look around like maybe your spouse lost his job. Maybe um, your neighbor lost his job. Maybe you think you're next, like you have a job, but you're worried you're going to get fired next week. So you save it. And, and the, the name for that, economists call that precautionary savings or, you know, plain English, it's, it's saving for a rainy day, except it's raining everywhere. So, so they are going to, they are going to, send the checks out, but people aren't going to spend it. And that's the reason you're not going to get the stimulative effect, but you are going to increase the deficit, which gets back to this debt to GDP ratio. So take the total debt divided by GDP. And that's, that's some ratio. The research is very convincing, very clear. A number of studies show this, that up to about 90%, so 90% debt to GDP, you get a little bit of something called a, a, Keynesian, a Keynesian multiplier, meaning you borrow a dollar, you spend a dollar 
and you get a dollar ten of GDP, or you get a dollar five of GDP, and it works maybe temporarily, but it works when people won't spend the money the government can. That's the idea. But when the debt to GDP GDP ratio goes above 90%. That's what physicists call a critical threshold or a phase transition. Now you're through the looking glass. Now the Keynesian multiplier drops below one, meaning you borrow a dollar, you spend a dollar, but you only get 90 cents of GDP. But meanwhile, the debt went up a dollar. So what's happening to the debt to GDP ratio? This is going up dollar for dollar, but this is going up 90 cents on the dollar. So the ratio is getting worse. Guess what the US GDP, debt to GDP ratio is today? The answer is it's about 135%. So we're way past that 90% threshold. And by the way, who's in that club? I can tell you, Lebanon, Greece, and Italy. So there's your lunch table for four, you know, the four super debtors league. And it just gets worse. And that G, that ratio past 90% is a headwind to growth because people look at it and like, hey, I don't have a PhD in economics, but I just don't like what I see. And people understand correctly. And this is the behavioral adaptation that policymakers on Wall Street do not understand. But the, the, the behavioral ad, adaptations people look at say, you know, I don't know how this is going to end, but it's going to end. I'm either going to, we're either going to have a default or we're going to have something like hyperinflation to make the debt go away, or they're going to raise my taxes. Not sure which, maybe all of the above, but I, I have to save more money to meet my lifetime goals in the face of some bad outcome that's going to come out of this. That's the real world behavior. And economists know very little about the real world. So, um, so the point is, Increasing the money supply doesn't work because velocity is declining. Increasing deficits doesn't work because people are saving, not spending, and they're preparing for worse outcomes. So neither one of these, you can call it money printing or spending, but don't call it stimulus because it doesn't stimulate. We're not getting out of this. And that's why I call my book, The New Great Depression. The people ask me, are we going to have a recession? And my answer is we might be in a recession right now and not even know it. Uh, we could be facing a global recession, including China, but just focusing on the US because uh, because that's the Fed's sort of territory. So Powell saying, you know, the economy's great is, is nonsense. What he said, he said, you know, by the end of the year, we could be looking at 4.2% unemployment, 35 to 4% interest rates, and, you know, kind of 2.7% inflation. And you're like, wait a second, inflation is 8.6 today. How do you get to, you know, 2.7? Number one, and then what about rising unemployment and, um, uh, and and higher interest rates? How do you reconcile those things? He said all three of those things, but what state of the world could make those things come true? There's only one, which is a recession. A recession would do it. A recession will raise unemployment. Higher interest rates will cause the recession, and the recession will cause inflation to go down. So, in effect, Powell was saying we're going to have a recession. Inflation, yeah, prices go up, so we understand that. Or maybe put differently, the value of your money goes down. You don't get as much for your money, same thing. But inflation, broadly speaking, has two causes. One is called, not to get too technical, but it's called cost push. This comes from the supply side. So there's a shortage of oil. If there, and we've got a financial and economic war going on between Russia uh, and the United States. The U.S. really started, but U.S., EU, Canada, Australia, Japan versus Russia. Um, that's obviously disrupting supply chain, cutting down energy supply, causing the price of oil to go up, et cetera. So that's coming from the supply side. And you're exactly right. The Fed can't drill for oil. The Fed can't plant wheat. The Fed can't make semiconductors. So they can't do anything about this. And the supply chains are breaking down. They were breaking down before the war in Ukraine, but Ukraine has made it worse. The other source of inflation is called um, demand pull. And this is when individuals, you, me, and all of our viewers and, you know, everyday Canadians and Americans worry about inflation. We say, well, you know, I'm just thinking about buying a refrigerator. Better buy it now before the price goes up with a car, house, or whatever it, it might be. They're different, but they affect each other. When, when, the, when the cost push inflation from the supply side has enough effect, there's a tipping point or critical threshold in, in psychology. We say, you know... Maybe it is out of control. I better go buy some stuff. Then the velocity of money goes up and then you get inflation. So the Fed can't do anything about cost push. They can't do anything about the price of oil. And you're right about that. But they're looking at the demand side, you know, saying, hey, if this supply thing goes on long enough, eventually the psychology will change and we'll get demand pull uh, and behavioral. And that is really hard to, to change. So what they're trying to do, they know they can't change the supply side, but they're trying to squash the demand side before it gets out of control. Now, the question, of course, is can they do it? 
The answer is they can do it, but at what cost? So a general rule of thumb, this is really simple. You have to get, uh, forget about nominal interest rates. Nominal interest rates are the rates you see on your screen, you hear about the headlines and all that. Real interest rates are nominal interest rates minus inflation. Take the inflation out and see what's left. Well, right now, real interest rates are about 2%, actually one, one and three quarters under the Fed's policy rate. Inflation is 8.6%. So, you know, just round numbers, one and a half minus uh, eight and a half, uh, that's, uh, that makes the inflation rate negative seven. It's nowhere near. It's got to be positive two. Real rates have to be plus two to, to squash inflation. Right now, they're negative seven. So that implies that the Fed has to raise interest rates to 10.5% to get to positive to real interest rates. That's never going to happen. They're never going to get there. They will destroy the economy long before they get there. So the Fed has no hope of squashing inflation from the demand side, as you described, by raising rates, unless inflation comes down for other reasons. So what they're going to do, they're going to keep raising rates, you know, two, two and a half, three, three and a half, four, hope that inflation comes down from eight to maybe three, although I think that's a stretch. You could get into positive real rate territory, but they're really far away from it. So I think, by the way, it, I, I described what they're trying to do. I should make it clear they're going to fail. They, they, the, only way, the only way inflation comes down the way we're talking about is if they trash the economy, a severe recession. If that happens, yeah, you say, well, do you, people still need to put gas in their cars. Well, you're right, but not if they're unemployed because they're not going to work. There's a lot here that's just for show. It sounds good on TV, but um, th there's a lot less here than we see that. But the point is, this is not over anytime soon. And even if it were, when you break supply chains, you can't just put them back together. It's like breaking a vase in a thousand pieces, and you gotta go buy a new vase. It's gonna take years to undo this damage. So I spoke to the individual who was probably the single individual most responsible for building the modern supply chain. It was 30 years from 1989 to 2019. Uh, it was headed one of the largest companies in the world, and this is what they did, among other things. Uh, and he said, Jim, you have to understand, it took us 30 years to build it. It took us three years to blow it up. It's not going to come back in a year. This is going to take 5, 10, 15 years to build a new one. So, so what, it's what I call supply chain 2.0. Well, buying a refrigerator is a good idea. Buying a freezer might be a better idea. We're looking for food shortages by the fall. Now, when I say food shortages in Africa and Middle East, this will mean mass starvation. You may see the greatest humanitarian crisis in history because they literally can't get the food. Everyone's like, well, gee, you can't get Ukrainian weight at wheat. What's the big deal? Buy it from somewhere else. There is, no, there is nowhere else. Canada and the United States grow an enormous amount of wheat, but we use most of it internally and uh, we feed because it's not for humans by the way we feed our animals so this is how you feed cows pigs this is how you get beef and pork this is an example of the supply chain how it filters all the way through so you would expect higher prices to persist you would expect food shortages uh, buying a freezer is not a bad idea um, and uh, the future supply chain is going to be the it goes by different names uh, Janet Yellen calls it friend shoring uh, Macron calls it uh, constellation uh, I call it the College of Nations, but basically we'll have supply chains and trade, but it'll be sort of members only. So U.S., Canada, Australia, Europe, others, Japan, uh, will be invited to join, but not China. You know, Russia is going to be in the waiting room for a while. We, sh we should be better allies of Russia, but the, the, the Democrats in the United States have pretty much made that impossible, at least for the short run. Uh, and then there'll be other countries that are kind of neutral in, in that scheme, you know, Brazil, India, and others. But the point is you'll still have trade and you'll have supply chains, but it'll be kind of friendly countries, members only, uh, and exclude China. So that decoupling is going to go ahead. The Chinese seem to be not only fine with it, but they're actually leading the way. Uh, you know, semiconductor manufacturing is moving back to the United States. Um, you know, the 20 billion of uh, new semiconductor plants from Intel. And why is Taiwan Semiconductor spending over $5 billion to build new semiconductor fabrication plants in the United States? Well, obviously, because they're worried about China. We're reshuffling the deck, but it, none of this stuff is easy. I mean, uh, semiconductor plants take five years to build a new refinery. Forget it. That's like seven to 10 years. We haven't had one in the United States since 1977. So it's going to take a while to do all this. Well, we can do it. So if I said we're definitely going to have inflation, you would know what to do. You'd buy gold, hard assets, land, silver, treasury notes, government bonds, etc. If I said we're definitely going to have deflation, 
you would also know what to do. You would uh, reduce leverage. You would uh, have more cash, uh, and there are other there are other assets you could go into. The problem is we could have both. We, there's no question we have inflation right now. It's 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 front and center. But if the Fed squashes it and causes a recession or worse, you could flip to deflation very quickly. So this is going to sound like a, 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 an obvious statement. What you want is diversification. Sounds obvious, but most people don't know what diversification is. I see people, I've got 50 stocks in 10 different sectors. I'm highly diversified. I'm like, no, you're not. You have one asset class called stocks. Real diversification, have a sli slice of stocks, gold, real estate, cash, um, agriculture is a good investment, energy, forget you know, the green new scam. That's a joke. Uh, oil and natural gas are going to be around for a long time. So 90% is the critical threshold. The U.S. is at 131%, highest in history, which means we are well past the point where you can borrow your way to growth or you can borrow your way out of a debt crisis. And we were heading for a debt crisis. So the way it works is raise interest rates, tighten money, reduce the balance sheet, et cetera, get unemployment up. It doesn't sound like a desirable goal, but that's, that's what it takes. And that's what happened in 1982. Get unemployment high enough so people are buying hamburger instead of steak. They're buying, you know, whatever is the least expensive thing on the shelf, day old bread instead of new bread, or they're not buying gasoline because they're not going to work, et cetera. That will bring prices down, but at a very high cost, which we, we just talked about, which is high unemployment and uh, lower productivity. Uh, meanwhile, the U.S. debt it keeps going up. We haven't really talked about the debt. That part of it looks like 1981. But if you throw in a global financial crisis, then it starts to look more like 2008. Yeah, well, that's like a glacier. Uh, glaciers are extremely powerful, but they move extremely slowly. There's some exceptions, but they, they kind of like, you know, an inch a year, a couple inches a year, but they, but they move mountains. I mean, they just, they create rivers, they create canyons, they move mountains. They're extremely powerful, but slow. That's a good metaphor for the impact of, of debt. And when I talk about debt, in particular with the United States, but you can apply this to any country, I focus on the, the debt to GDP ratio because you can't really talk about debt in isolation without thinking about the capacity to pay the debt. In a simple example, if you have a $50,000 balance on your credit card and you're making $30,000 a year and trying to pay rent in New York, et cetera, good luck. You're probably going to go bankrupt or at least default on that card. But if you owe $50,000 on your credit card, but you're making $5 million a year, it's, you, know, you just write a check, it's no big deal. My point is you can't look at a $50,000 debt and decide if it's a problem or not, unless you compare it to the income. And if it's too low, it's a problem. And if the income's high, not a problem. So that's why you use the debt to GDP ratio. The US just hit uh, $31 trillion in uh, in national debt, that is national debt, almost all of it in the form of U.S. Treasury securities. Uh, not all of it, there are other obligations, but mostly U.S. Treasury securities. Well, is that a problem or not? Well, one way to answer the question is compare it to GDP, do the ratio. The answer is that ratio is now a, a little over 130%. What was it in 1980 uh, when Ronald Reagan was uh, elected? Um, the answer is 30%. 30% is completely comfortable. That's like the person with the $50,000 debt is making millions, no big deal. 30% um, is comfortable. 50%, yeah, getting up there. Uh, Angela Merkel and all her years in Germany, and, uh, and there's a lot of research to back this up, says that 60% was the limit. And that's what the Master's Treaty that created the European Union and the European Central Bank, uh, that was their goal. They said, don't go over 60%. If you do, you're expected to take measures, you know, raise taxes or, or you know, reduce debt or reduce spending, do something to get that back down under 60%. If you, uh, you say, what's the critical threshold where, you know, water turns to steam or, you know, water turns to ice or something changes in such a way that it's not the same. It's, it's radically different, but it happens very quickly. The, end, the, best, the, the best research says the answer is 90%. And this comes out of, you know, Ken Rogoff at uh, Harvard, also Carmen Reinhardt, who's now the uh, chief economist at the World Bank. But they've looked at uh, hundreds of cases over hundreds of years. And I like that because it's not just, you know, kind of cherry picking data. Uh, developed economies, developing economies, 
uh, economies that issue debt in their own currencies, ones that issue debt in other currencies, principally U.S. dollars, et cetera. So, you know, a wide variety of case studies. And they show that when you when your debt to GDP ratio goes over 90 percent, your your multiplier of an additional debt uh, of additional debt goes below one. So just to put that in context, at, at 30 percent, if I borrow a dollar and spend a dollar, I might get a dollar 30 of growth. You know, assuming you spend it wisely, that's a, that's a big condition. But uh, you borrow a dollar and spend a dollar and get a dollar thirty of growth. Okay, the debt was productive if you if you put it to good use. Uh, but that that dollar thirty gets smaller and smaller. As you get close to ninety percent, it goes to a dollar twenty, a dollar ten, a dollar five. Past ninety percent, you know, roughly, uh, you borrow a dollar and you spend a dollar and you only get ninety five cents of growth. You don't get your dollar back in terms of GDP. And then 90% and 85%, et cetera. So 90% is the critical threshold. The U.S. is at 131%, highest in history, which means we are well past the point where you can borrow your way to growth or you can borrow your way out of a debt crisis. And we were heading for a debt crisis. Now, you know, Stephanie Kelton, she's the big brain of uh, modern monetary theory. She's a professor at State University of New York. She says it doesn't matter that uh, yeah, she, they always point to Japan. Japan is at uh, 280%, um, way past any any member of the peer group. Um, China's probably higher. China's a little more opaque because, well, because they are, but also they they don't have as much national debt. If you, if you look at the national debt to GDP, it's modest, but they have an enormous amount of, of provincial debt and the Banks, the banking system is is owned by the government or controlled by the government. So when you throw in when you throw in the bank debt, the state-owned enterprises, the provincial debt, and the and the government. So that's the real national debt. Kelton says, uh, Stephanie Kelton says, uh, it doesn't matter because um, you're borrowing in your own currency. So if you're Argentina and you borrow in dollars and you print pesos, how are you going to pay the dollars back unless you have, you know, huge trade surpluses, which they don't. So they just default, you know, Argentina is a serial defaulter and everyone expects that. If you um, borrow in dollars and you print dollars, which the United States does, they're like, what's the problem? Just print the dollars and pay the money back. Uh, Well, that's true. If you print dollars, there's no reason to default on dollar debt because you actually can print the money and buy the bonds. But it doesn't mean nothing else bad happens. Uh, what about uh, inflation or hyperinflation? Um, what about uh, the foreign exchange rate? Uh, you know, the exchange rate can collapse. And th- these modern monetary theorists um, show very little understanding of the international aspects. They treat the U.S. like a closed economy, which it's not. I mean, if it were a closed economy and we didn't have to worry about trade deficits, trade surpluses, capital flows, exchange rates, you know, foreign credit, you know, J- uh, China owning $1 trillion of U.S. Treasury securities, which they do. If you didn't have to worry about any of that, I, I think they'd probably still be wrong, but they'd have a better case. But you do, um, and they they don't. They're just not very knowledgeable about any of those things. But you can think of exchange rates as a conveyor belt. Exchange rates are one way the problems go from one country to another, or good things can go from one country to another, uh, depending on whether your exchange rate is going up or down, the impact on terms of trade, etc. But they, they completely ignore all that. They also ignore the role of commercial banks. They, they just look at the Treasury and the Fed and look at money supply, but like kind of M0, but don't understand how commercial banks create M1 and they do their own thing. They're not uh, they're not on as short a leash as, as they seem to think. But, but it, you know, if you read Stephanie Kelton's book, The Deficit Myth, she says, well, we don't really need a bond market, U.S. bond market. Uh, we only have a bond market as a favor to investors because it gives them a place to put their money. Uh, but why, you know, why have, um, you know, he said, you have government spending. So the Treasury borrows money by issuing bonds and then the Fed monetizes the bonds by buying the bonds. And that gives the Treasury the money to pay the bills, et cetera. She says, do away with all that. Just give the Fed, you know, wire instructions for Lockheed. And if you need five F-35 fighter jets, order them and just send the money right to Lockheed. Why do you need a bond market? I mean, she actually says that. So, okay, kind of, I mean, legally that might be possible, but to suggest that you can do that without consequences is nonsense. And then you say, what about inflation? Uh, well, 
shoot their view is as long as there's excess capacity and unmet needs etc you know you're not going to have inflation because there's a lot of slack in the economy that's a legitimate debate but what they say when inflation happens raise taxes um and the, by the way they also say you don't need a tax system because if you can just print the money why do you have to collect taxes and their answer is we collect taxes to redistribute income Okay, well, at least they're honest. I mean, that's kind of a socialist model, but they're honest about it. Uh, but but it's important to bear in mind that Stephanie was the principal economic advisor to Bernie Sanders in 2016 and 2020. And Bernie Sanders today is the chairman of the Senate Budget Committee, controls the purse strings. So um, coming out of Congress and Biden's kind of a cipher, he's, you know, he's barely aware of his own existence. So uh, Sanders is in a powerful position and she's, She's the the Bernie whisperer, so to speak, who's behind all this. So uh, if you ask the typical member of Congress, can you define modern monetary theory? They'll look at you funny. They've either never heard of it or they certainly don't know what it means. MMT, you know, but they're acting as they're acting in accordance with modern monetary theory. Whether they know it or not doesn't matter. The actual behavior of the Congress, and again, just go back to COVID 2020, because we talked about the debt to GDP, GDP ratio. So in um around may or june um 2020 trump put through a um a one sorry a two trillion dollar covid relief package and that was when you know the the, pay, the paycheck protection plan that was 800 billion and everyone got the the 1200 check you know etc cetera, etc cetera. and then at the end of december at the very end of the trump administration they did another trillion dollars uh, almost uh and that's when everyone got the 600 dollar checks and now you're up, up to 1800 uh, by the way those checks that is helicopter money um that's you know what the fed does is is kind of nonsense but when it's fiscal policy not monetary policy and you're handing out checks that is helicopter money and credit to larry summers for saying you're going to get inflation out of this well biden comes into office in january 2021 and he's like not to be outdone he did his own COVID relief package that was another two trillion dollars and that's when we all got the 1400 dollar checks they just they handed them out and then later that year uh, or they did the um trillion dollar infrastructure package and then just to top it off we what did we get recently was the um the, uh, just under a trillion dollar Green New Deal, I call it the Green New Scam. Well, and the baseline budget deficit, before everything I just described, the baseline budget deficit was about a trillion dollars a year. So take a trillion dollars for 2020, 2021, and, and 2022, add on you know two trillion for Trump's first package, one trillion for a second one, uh, two trillion for Biden's first package, one trillion for the green new scam and i think a trillion for infrastructure that's seven trillion dollars on top of the two trillion dollar baseline budget deficit so that's nine trillion dollars piled on top of what was at the time um about a a 21 trillion dollar national debt. So that's how we got to 30 trillion that's how the ratio went from 106 to 131. these numbers are mind-boggling and mmt says doesn't matter but it does matter and it, it shows up the way i described earlier which is it it slows growth you don't get growth so best case for the u.s is very slow weak growth which we saw from 2009 to 2019. worst case is you throw a recession on top of that which we're heading for uh, and the u.s will be in fiscal distress